Hello everyone, I am Mohammed Hamama, and this is your ASCP preparation camp. In this camp, we will go through each topic on the ASCP lecture list. In this part of Normal Hemostasis and Coagulation, we delve into the world of coagulation regulatory mechanisms, where a delicate balance between clotting and bleeding is maintained by some incredible natural anticoagulants and their cofactors. Inhibitors and their trusty cofactors are the unsung heroes of the coagulation system. They're here to keep things in check, creating feedback loops to maintain the fine balance between excessive clotting and abnormal bleeding. Their mission, to slow down the activation of procoagulants and limit the production of thrombin, ensuring that coagulation stays put, doesn't go haywire, and avoids both excessive clotting and troublesome thrombosis. Now, let's meet the principal regulators on duty. Tissue Factor Pathway Inhibitor, TFPI, antithrombin, AT, and activated protein C, APC, are at the forefront of this essential task. They're like the guardians of the coagulation galaxy. Any deficiencies in these proteins, whether acquired or inherited, might throw the hemostatic balance off kilter, leading to an increased risk of venous thromboembolic disease. First up, we have TFPI, a Kunitz-type serine protease inhibitor. This unsung hero specializes in regulating the tissue factor pathway. Synthesized primarily by endothelial cells and found on platelets, TFPI wears multiple hats to get the job done. In the initiation of coagulation, when factor 7A and tissue factor join forces to activate factors 9 and 10, TFPI steps in like a seasoned detective. It inhibits coagulation in a two-step process. First, it binds and inactivates activated factor 10 through its Kunitz-2 domain, and then, it takes on 7A, tissue factor with its Kunitz-1 domain. TFPI doesn't work alone, it has a trusty sidekick known as protein S, which also serves as a cofactor of activated protein C, APC. Protein S gives TFPI a helping hand and enhances activated factor 10 day inhibition by TFPI tenfold. This dynamic duo ensures that the tissue factor, factor 7A, and 10A reaction is short-lived. Thanks to TFPI's vigilant watch, once it limits extrinsic 10A and factor 10A, additional production of factor 10A and factor 9A shifts to the intrinsic pathway. This coordinated effort keeps coagulation in check and ensures that it remains a localized response, ready to respond when needed without going overboard. In the world of coagulation, it's these unsung heroes and their seamless teamwork that keep our circulatory system in balance, ensuring that clotting and bleeding play their parts perfectly. Next we're delving into the world of protein C, a master regulator in the intricate dance of coagulation. So, let's explore how this crucial protein keeps our blood's delicate balance in check. In the grand spectacle of coagulation, thrombin is a central figure. It orchestrates the formation of the clot by cleaving fibrinogen and activating factor 5, 8, 11, and 13. But what happens when we don't want clotting to get out of hand? Enter the protein C system, our secret weapon in regulating thrombin's enthusiastic efforts. This system turns thrombin from a coagulation enthusiast into an anticoagulant when it binds to a cell membrane protein called thrombomodulin. It's like hitting the brakes on coagulation. Our superhero team doesn't stop there. Another membrane protein, the endothelial cell protein C receptor, EPCR, boosts the action of thrombin thrombomodulin. It achieves this by binding to both protein C and activated protein C, APC, supercharging the activation of protein C. After activation, APC separates from EPCR and locks arms with its partner in crime, free plasma protein S, together, they create a formidable duo, the APC protein S complex. This duo is here to save the day. The APC protein S complex doesn't just twiddle its thumbs, it gets to work in activating factor 5A and 8A. These are the very factors that are essential for thrombin generation. By neutralizing them, our dynamic duo puts the brakes on further coagulation. Now, let's talk about protein S, the anchor that stabilizes APC. This remarkable protein is produced in the liver and circulates in two forms in the plasma. About 40% of protein S is in a free form, and the rest is cosily bound to C4B, binding protein, C4BBP. But here's the catch, only the free plasma protein S can serve as the cofactor for APC in the protein C anticoagulant pathway. It's the unbound protein S that does the heavy lifting in keeping coagulation in check. This dance of proteins isn't just theoretical, it has significant clinical implications. Deficiencies or mutations in protein C, protein S, or factor 5 can disrupt this delicate balance, increasing the risk of venous thromboembolic disease. 
And here's the real testament to the importance of the protein C regulatory system. Infants born without protein C face a severe condition known as purpura fulminans, and survival is rare without treatment involving protein C replacement and anticoagulation. Welcome to the world of serpins, a fascinating family of proteins, each with its unique role in the intricate dance of coagulation. Today, we shine the spotlight on the star of the show, antithrombin, and its supporting cast. Serpins, a family of proteins, include antithrombin, which was one of the first coagulation regulators to step into the limelight in clinical hemostasis laboratories. But they are not alone in this ensemble. Antithrombin, our leading character, is a serine protease inhibitor, aka serpin. It's the valiant protector against serine proteases like thrombin and factors 9A, factor 10, 11A, 12A, precolicrian, and plasmin. Joining the cast is heparin cofactor 2, which primarily takes on thrombin and gets a boost from heparin for its anticoagulant prowess. The story of heparin's therapeutic use unfolds as different forms target specific factors. In the live performance inside our bodies, AD engages in a gripping battle with thrombin. They form an inactive duo called the thrombin-antithrombin complex, TAT, offering a vital measurement to track thrombosis. Our next character, ZPI, with its trusty sidekick, Protein Z, steps in to inhibit factor XA. They form a formidable trio with calcium and phospholipid, making sure factor 10 XA knows its place. Protein C inhibitor, another versatile serpin, is a jack of all trades. It can inhibit various proteases, including activated protein C, APC, thrombin, factor 10, factor 11A, and urokinase. Depending on the situation, it can play different roles, anticoagulant, procoagulant, or fibrinolytic inhibitor. Last but not least, there are serpins like A1, protease inhibitor and A2, macroglobulin. They have the power to temporarily inhibit serine proteases and then gracefully step back when their job is done. Fibrinolysis. It's the phase where our body's brilliant mechanisms come full circle to ensure the timely resolution of clots. Join us as we delve into the intricate world of fibrinolysis. As the curtains close on the coagulation process, the stage is set for fibrinolysis. This final phase typically begins a few hours after the formation of fibrin clots. Meet our star initiators, TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, and UPA, urokinase plasminogen activator, released in response to inflammation and the coagulation process. Before the grand performance begins, let's introduce the key cast members, plasminogen, plasmin, TPA, UPA, and PAI-1, plasminogen activator inhibitor-1. During the earlier act of clot formation, these proteins are carefully incorporated into the developing fibrin clot. They attach to lysine residues on fibrin through their specialized Kringle loops, ensuring they are in the right place at the right time. And now, the main event. Fibrinolysis is a controlled, systematic process. As the drama unfolds, plasmin, bound to fibrin, takes center stage. TPA and UPA, our star activators, play crucial roles in activating fibrin-bound plasminogen several hours after the formation of a clot. This degradation of fibrin is essential for restoring normal blood flow during the healing of vascular structures. As in any great performance, it's a balancing act. Fibrinolysis is finely tuned by activators and inhibitors. Too much fibrinolysis can result in bleeding, as clots dissolve prematurely. On the flip side, insufficient fibrinolysis can lead to clot expansion and an increased risk of thrombosis. Plasminogen and Plasmin Join us as we unravel the mystery behind these remarkable enzymes and their crucial roles in fibrinolysis. Let's set the stage with our first character, Plasminogen. This plasma enzyme precursor, with a molecular weight of 92,000 daltons, is produced by the liver. Plasminogen features five glycosylated loops known as Kringles, which are essential for its function. When teamed up with activators like TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, and UPA, urokinase plasminogen activator, plasminogen can bind to lysine molecules within fibrin during clot formation, a crucial prerequisite for the upcoming fibrinolysis process. Now, the transformation begins. Fibrin-bound plasminogen is converted into its active, two-chain form, known as plasmin. This remarkable change takes place when a neighboring fibrin-bound TPA or UPA cleaves plasminogen between specific amino acids. Plasmin, our star serine protease, specializes in the systematic breakdown of fibrin polymers, making it the ultimate clot-dissolving hero. As plasmin takes center stage within the fibrin clot, it diligently digests the fibrin, bringing vessels back to life. 
its binding to lysine residues within fibrin prevents unchecked activity, keeping it localized. But here's the twist, as fibrin gets broken down, it exposes more carboxyterminal lysine residues that attract additional plasminogen and TPA, further accelerating the clot digestion process. The show wouldn't be complete without a twist, unbound or free plasmin has the potential to cause primary fibrinolysis by digesting plasma fibrinogen, factor 5, factor 8, and fibrinectin. Thankfully, circulating plasma A2 antiplasmin swiftly steps in, binding to and deactivating any free plasmin, preventing unwanted systemic activity. ACT2, plasminogen activation, unleashing the clot dissolving power. Act 2 begins with tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA, taking the lead. Secreted by endothelial cells, TPA has two glycosylated Kringle regions, crucial to its action. During clot formation, TPA forms covalent bonds with lysine and fibrin, anchoring itself to the thrombus's surface. Side by side with plasminogen, TPA sparks the transformation of plasminogen into active plasmin, setting the stage for fibrin digestion. While TPA exists in the bloodstream, it's usually bound to inhibitors and is later removed. In clinical applications, synthetic recombinant TPAs mimic the body's natural TPA and dissolve abnormal clots. Joining the cast is urokinase plasminogen activator, or UPA, released by various cells. With only one Kringle region, UPA doesn't firmly attach to fibrin. While its physiological impact is relatively minor compared to TPA, it becomes part of the mix during thrombus formation. Purified UPA preparations, similar to TPA, are harnessed to dissolve thrombi in medical conditions like myocardial infarction and deep vein thrombosis. These natural and clinical versions of TPA and UPA ensure that fibrinolysis is initiated and controlled. Clot control with the protagonists of the Clot Busting Act, Plasminogen Activator Inhibitor 1, Alpha-2 Antiplasmin, and Thrombin-Activatable Fibrinolysis Inhibitor. Our first act shines the spotlight on PAI-1, the primary inhibitor of plasminogen activation. This single-chain glycoprotein serine protease inhibitor plays a vital role in the clot-busting drama by inactivating both TPA and UPA, stopping them from converting plasminogen into plasmin. Various cell types, including endothelial cells and smooth muscle cells, contribute to PAI-1 production, with platelets storing a significant portion. Under normal circumstances, circulating TPA becomes bound to PAI-1, unless an emergency like endothelial cell activation following trauma requires TPA to initiate fibrinolysis. Remarkably, TPA binding to fibrin offers protection from PAI-1's inhibition, creating a safeguarded environment. Now, in the second act, alpha-2 antiplasmin, synthesized in the liver, takes center stage as the guardian against free plasmin. This unique serine protease inhibitor features N and C terminal extensions. During thrombus formation, the N terminus of AP forms a covalent bond with fibrin through the action of factor 13A. The C terminal portion contains lysine, capable of interacting with plasmin's lysine binding kringles. Free plasmin can either bind to fibrin, thus safeguarding itself from AP, or attach to the C terminus of AP, leading to swift and irreversible inactivation. Consequently, AP, particularly with its C-terminal lysine, acts as a break on fibrinolysis by competing for plasminogen binding with fibrin and directly inactivating plasmin. Our final act features thrombin-activatable fibrinolysis inhibitor, TOFI, a plasma procarboxypeptidase produced in the liver. Its activation, courtesy of the thrombin-thrombomodulin complex, is similar to the process responsible for the protein C pathway activation. However, TOFI operates independently, functioning as an antifibrinolytic agent. Its mission, to obstruct fibrinolysis. How? By meticulously snipping off carboxyterminal lysine residues from partially degraded fibrin. This precise trimming action prevents TPA and plasminogen from binding to fibrin and, in turn, halts the formation of plasmin. Toffee's role isn't confined to mere clot regulation, it may also influence the dynamics of inflammation and wound healing. Welcome to a mesmerizing journey as we unravel the intricate clot story through the artistry of plasmin and the enigmatic fragments it creates, starring D-dimer as the signature mark of Fibrin's crossroads. Our tale begins with the masterful strokes of plasmin, the clot's nemesis. Plasmin's artistry results in a series of distinctive fragments, X, Y, D, E, and DD. These fragments are no ordinary creations, they actively inhibit hemostasis by preventing platelet activation and impeding fibrin polymerization. Fragment X is akin to the central E domain flanked by two D domains, DED. 
fragment Y emerges as the E domain after bidding adieu to 1D domain, DE. Further digestion transforms them into individual D and E domains. Among these fragments, a star stands out, D-dimer. It's a fusion of two D domains from separate fibrin molecules, thanks to the skillful work of factor 13A, a cross-linking maestro. Unlike the other fragments that result from plasmin's digestion of fibrin or fibrinogen, D-dimer is unique to cross-linked fibrin digestion. As a result, D-dimer becomes a distinctive marker, signaling the activation of thrombosis and fibrinolysis, orchestrated by the likes of thrombin, factor 13A, and plasmin. To unveil the presence of these fragments, one can turn to quantitative or semi-quantitative immunoassays, shedding light on fibrinolytic activity. D-dimer, in particular, takes the spotlight and becomes detectable by a monoclonal antibody for D-dimer antigen. Various automated quantitative laboratory immunoassays, as well as other formats, including point-of-care tests using whole blood, can unveil the intricate details of this clot narrative. The D-dimer immunoassay transforms into a diagnostic maestro, used to identify conditions like chronic and acute DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. Its harmonious notes help rule out venous thromboembolism when suspicions of deep venous thrombosis or pulmonary embolism arise, making it a valuable tool in the medical repertoire. Stay up to date with our latest videos by hitting that subscribe button and activating notifications. Be the first to know when we release new and exciting content. Don't keep all this valuable information to yourself, share this video with your friends who might find it interesting and beneficial. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them down below. Until next time, take care and goodbye.